Hey love, my name is Brittany Pollard and you are now rocking with the Everyday Intentions podcast, your source for real conversation centered around stepping into your personal power one intention at a time. This podcast is all about owning our voice, taking up space, expressing ourselves and moving through life at our own pace. You are invited to the magic. So let's roll. What is up, my beautiful, amazing, abundant, and prosperous people? My name is Brittany Pollard, and you are listening to the Everyday Intentions podcast, where we talk all about change, growth, transformation, and really creating our lives on our own terms through small, daily, intentional thoughts and actions. On today's show, I had the pleasure of connecting with the brilliant Tiana Tai, and we talked all about intentional leadership. Now, I just love those two words, first of all, but we talked all about intentional leadership and I really feel like this episode was awesome because we got into the principles of what it takes to be a leader. And I know most of the people listening to this show are on their boss stuff. So they're into creating, whether it's a business or a whole different lifestyle, there's going to be some type of leadership involved and really being the driver of your own movement. So I love the pointers Tiana shared about how we can organize ourselves and really embody these type of leadership needed to get us to that next level. She also talked about it from an organizational standpoint because that is her field of expertise. And she talked about the difference between being an actual boss and being a leader. So if you are someone who currently manages employees, I definitely, definitely stand for you to listen into this episode so you can see if you're operating as a boss or if you're operating as an intentional leader because the way you connect to your people is going to be on a whole different level. Tiana Tai is an industrial organizational psychologist and leadership coach from Atlanta, Georgia. You can think of her like a creative CEO's secret weapon of all things hiring, managing, and leading a dream team. When she's not supporting leaders on their journey, you can usually find her cuddling with her two puppies and firefighter husband while sipping on a glass of Cabernet. Enjoy this episode. What is up, my people? Welcome back to another episode of the podcast. My name is Brittany Pollard, and today I have the lovely Miss Tiana Tai on the show today. Tiana and I are very new to each other. We're actually in a similar podcast group. And I put out a call just for some amazing epic guests to come on the show. And she offered to just come grace us with her presence. And I'm really excited for what we're going to talk about today, because I think it's very important. And I think it applies to everyone who listens to this show. Um, We're going to be talking about leadership. We're also going to be talking about creating healthy work environments for yourself, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you work for someone else, and just really setting ourselves up to be that leader in our life so that we can transfer that energy into what we do professionally. So Tiana, welcome to the show. I'm so grateful to have you. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited about this. <laughs> yes, yes, me too. Uh, so we, before we get started, I would love for you to just go ahead and introduce yourself to our listeners. Okay, yeah, for sure. Uh, so she has already said it, but my name is Tiana Tai, and I am, it's a very long title, it's Industrial Organizational Psychologist. Uh, we call it IO, and it's a thing. You can look it up. I promise you it exists. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm also a leadership coach, and my hometown is good old Atlanta, Georgia. I've spent a lot of my career really just working with small female owned businesses primarily, both in person and totally virtual. And it's been really amazing to help them hire their dream teams, help them, you know, manage and develop. And then it always transitions one way or another into some ongoing leadership development because leadership is just one of those things where for a lot of us, we tend to get thrown into it or we start our businesses and don't really think about what it means as we hire. Like we hire for the utility of it, but sometimes that leadership aspect isn't quite as innate as we expect it to be. So one way or another, the conversation of leadership always comes up and I love it. It's it's my thing. It's definitely what I love to talk about. And when I'm not talking about it, I'm usually like, 
chilling at my house with a glass of Cabernet. I'm a total homebody, honestly. I love being at home. I love being in my space. I've got two amazing puppies. They're wiener dog uh, pit bull mixes, which sounds really freaking weird. (laughs) I swear to you, they are so adorable. I promise you. (laughs) So between them and my husband, I'm usually good at home, uh, but I do. I get out. Hey, there's no shame in staying home. I love being home. And if I go out, I love being home early. (laughs) Yes. Oh my goodness. Are you familiar with Enneagram? I am. Okay. So I'm an Enneagram five. And one of our big things is like, we tend to protect our time and it's a growing spot. We kind of coveted a little bit too much. So like being home in my own space without, you know, just some of the stressors of others, it can be really nice and restorative if I do so (laughs) responsibly. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I get that 100%. I've I've taken that test, but I can't remember what I was. Um, Part Mm -hmm. of me wants to say a four, but I don't want to make it up. So I need to take it again or just um, log into my profile and see what it is. You inspired me, so I'm going to do that. (laughs) Oh, and I'm telling you, I wasn't actually planning on bringing this up, but Enneagram, like I do fully intend on incorporating it into my coaching practice. Like it's just the more that I dive deeper into it, the more that I'm just like, it would be a complete disservice to my clients and to the people that I'm working with. Cause it's so powerful, not only to understand yourself, but the real differentiator I feel like with Enneagram is that it's not just about what we do. It's about the underlying motivation. It's about why we are doing what we are doing. And that's the piece that I think a lot of personality tests like DISC or Myers-Briggs, like all the big ones that we usually use in work, Mm -hmm. uh, I think they're missing that piece. So now that I'm in it, I'm about to be in it because I feel like it's, I feel like it could be a game changer for, especially for teams and the relationship dynamics going on there. Oh yeah. Yeah. 100%. At the company I work for now, we, we don't do Enneagram but we do love language and that's just so we can understand like how to give feedback, what people appreciate Mm -hmm. most and how to individualize support for them. So yeah. You just made, you made my heart so happy just now. (laughs) (laughs) So did you know that they, they actually came out, I believe the author of love languages partnered with uh, some sort of business consultant and they came out with the workplace appreciation counterpart to it. Oh my gosh. I didn't know that. (laughs) I actually, I just finished that book a little bit ago. I've always, uh, I do talks about appreciation, but when they came out with the literal counterpart to the love languages, (laughs) I was like, oh, I am so into this. It's good. It's Uh, good. I'm going to have to check that out. That's perfect. (laughs) Yeah. It's cool. It's probably very much in line with what you guys are doing at your company Mm -hmm. uh, because it's the same five. So it's the physical touch, acts of service, gifts, quality time, and words of affirmation. Mm -hmm. They just manifest differently at work. So, you know, I may be quality time with my husband. I'm not as much quality time with all of my coworkers, you know, just like different aspects of what we prioritize and what we love. It, you know, it just comes out differently in the workplace sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, Especially physical touch. (laughs) Oh yeah. Physical touch. That's like a high five or a fist bump. And most of the time, even in the book, they're like, yeah, there's only so much we can do with this one. (laughs) This is inappropriate. So, you know, got to keep that pushing. <laughs> yeah. I got to be careful with that one right there. That one to get you in trouble. <laughs> yep. Uh, that's amazing. So, okay. So you're already on that as far as just really taking care of your, your clients and the people who you work with. So I want us to transition into what we were going to talk about today and really just talking about leadership and I think this is important because I know for my audience, a lot of people are either just starting moving into an entrepreneurial pursuit or, you know, they're really shifting and making a change in their life. If they're listening to this podcast, it's because they want to up level, they want to grow in some sort of capacity. And at the root of that, we have to be the leaders in whatever subject that we're going to move into 
And, Mm -hmm. you know, we need to really focus on being intentional about the moves that we're making. So I would love for you just to talk about what it means, what what intentional leadership means, and just give people tips on how to go about making sure that they are intentional and they are becoming those leaders of their lives. Oh yeah, I would love to. Okay. So I tend to start with the more like traditional definitions because there's two ways people tend to look at leadership just in general, before I even dive into what it really means to be intentionally leading others. But one school of thought is the more traditional, like leadership is when you are actively leading a group of people, uh, like within an organization or some, you know, context, right? Whether it's Mm -hmm. familial, in a business, whatever, you are actively leading a specific group of people. But then there's this other school of thought, which frankly, I align a bit more with, especially given like the age of the internet which is leadership is influence, point blank, period. Mm -hmm. So if you have influence over another human being in any capacity, you are a leader. And I really do identify with that definition. And I think your listeners will too, especially as we talk about, you know, stepping into whatever your biggest dream is and really going after that, like to do that, in a public way, we tend to put ourselves out there and people start asking us. And, you know, naturally, if we're really stepping into our power on it, we will develop some level of influence with somebody, which means that we are actually occupying the space of even just a little piece about what it means to be a leader. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to start with? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think it it takes the, the pressure that comes along with the word influencer mm-hmm. of needing it to look like, like this big thing with a billion followers and, and all of that. But I really love how you made it simple. If you're standing in your power and you're doing your thing and, and people are tapping in and they're in- interested, then you are having influence over them. Oh, absolutely. Like I believe in the power of one. So if there is one person, literally just one who's like bought in, to what you're doing and they care about your message. Yeah. You're an influencer. Mm -hmm. Like we can't, I, it, and it's difficult because in today's environment, it's like, if I don't got 10,000 followers, who am I? (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. Yes. So it's not, I'm not going to like minimize this and make it sound like, yeah, you're just going to believe that. And it's going to be great. No, we all struggle with Mm -hmm. uh, the idea of a massive audience and all of that, but it's just important to kind of work on building it into your mentality that the power of one is real. And if I'm influencing even a single person, then I'm an influencer. I am a leader. I'm leading somebody, even if it's not in the traditional capacity that we tend to think about in like business and work. And I love that because when you are more focused on service than on just saying a specific number of people, you know, you're really focused on the service that you're providing. That makes Mm -hmm. all the difference because you can have a smaller audience and maybe you have one, or maybe you only have a couple of people that you're working with, but yet you're showing up so powerfully for them. You're giving them your all versus having a giant stage and you're not really effectively touching lives. And I think it's important to just come back to the why of what you're doing and get to the root of that and detaching from what it looks like for other people has been my personal work. Um, And it comes back to like, why do you want this? Why are you doing this? Why is this important to you? Are you trying to be seen? Are you truly trying to help someone? (laughs) Right, right. And I love that you tapped into the idea of like, why are you doing this? Like, what is your purpose in this? Because it's a really good transition point to dive in a little bit deeper about what it means to be an intentional leader. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we can, if you have influence, mind you, someone gave you that influence. You can't just, I always say this and I'll dive into this a little bit later, but just because you're someone's boss does not mean you're their leader. Like somebody is voluntarily giving you influence. Like we don't just look up to people who don't deserve it. You know what I mean? If you, if you spot a phony quote unquote leader on Instagram, we can spot that out a mile away and we do not allow them to influence us. You know, if we're in tune and aligned to 
(laughs) what actually matters. Uh, But yeah, leadership is not a given, first of all. And I could talk about that a little bit more later. But when you're intentionally leading, you are tapped into that why. You are tapped into that deeper purpose behind what it is that you're doing. And because you're tapped into that, and that's like your foundation, you can actively decide in advance how you want to be perceived by the people that you are leading. Like all of this can be in alignment when it comes from a place of purpose, when it comes from, you know, your why, and when it really is deeply rooted in intention. Yes, I love that. And that that's what I think builds trust amongst mm-hmm. the audience. You know, like you said, when you can spot the phoniness from a mile away, but when you've got someone who's there and who's heart centered and you can really feel the effort that they're putting in, that's what builds to me a loyal either customer base or, you know, fan base or interest base by you really showing that you're, you're truly caring and you're showing up. Right. And it can be hard, like, you know, figuring out how you show up and I'm not even just online, like as a leader, even in person in real life, like we tend to want to protect ourselves a little bit. And that's why I love Brene. Like if you don't tune into Brene Brown, you need to listen to her, especially about vulnerability. Like that is something that's, it's critical to leaders though, especially because if you're leading people and you're not vulnerable, that means you're leading with a facade. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I don't even say that with judgment because we all slip into that at some point or another. Like when we don't feel safe ourselves, how can we lead others transparently? Like how can we lead others out of a place of vulnerability? (laughs) Oh, I felt that too. Okay. I was about to start (laughs) clapping, but I didn't want to get too loud. (laughs) No, that's so true. Yeah. So look, if if you haven't listened to her TED Talk, go listen to the TED Talk, watch the documentary, and then buy all her books because <laughs> it's some it's just it's a natural human tendency sometimes. Whenever we are operating out of fear, we do tend to kind of close ourselves off and go behind that wall. But if that's where you're operating out of you, there's no possible way for you to be truly leading intentionally. And it's kind of it's kind of scary to be honest, like to have those vulnerable conversations and put yourself out there and use your whole heart. Like it's not easy work in the slightest. And honestly, that's why I have a job and can do what I do because it's not easy work and it's not intuitive and we all have to work at it. Yeah, I agree 100%. Renee Brown, like she's one of my favorite authors and just in her spirit, I just enjoy her so much. And I saw her talk it's on Netflix it's it should still be on Netflix and I just love her I love how she's just so smart and educated and then she's also vulnerable and she's also an introvert so she comes out and she shares her piece but you know she she needs a lot of alone time to recharge and for me for someone who is also an introvert just seeing that and her that shifted my lens of what leadership should look like too Um, Because I think a lot of people think that they have to be this wildly outgoing, outspoken person in order to be effective or to be seen or to be heard. And when I saw her, I was like, wow, you can show up powerfully and not feel overstimulated so easily by trying to, you know, fall into someone else's narrative of what leadership looks like. So she's helped me on so many different levels. Just in her presence. Oh my God. So eat like I, and I align so much with what you just said. I remember taking like an, an introverted extroverted inventory back in grad school. Mm -hmm. And I am, I'm on the lesser side of introversion, but I'm definitely introverted. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting. Like before I stepped into the space of entrepreneurship, you know, I work in corporate, so I do have a corporate consulting job and I'm familiar with this work kind of in a more contained way where it's not, it's not my voice. Does that make mm-hmm. sense? Oh yeah. Uh, so even as an introvert, like figuring out what it felt like for me myself to show up as a leader for my own brand. Uh, and eventually I have an intern right now, but I don't have an actual team in place yet. But even figuring out in advance how I want to show up for my team that works for my brand, like 
she was so inspired. Like, I totally agree with you. She was so inspiring in that and just understanding like boundaries are okay. And, you know, you don't have to be, you know, totally out there, like complete go-getter. Like, you know what I mean? And I'm very, like I said, I'm an Enneagram five. And as you learn about it, you'll see, but I'm very academic. And a lot of people can tell by the way I talk, but I also try to be vulnerable because sometimes I can hide behind my books. So, you know, that's a thing too. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. But I'm very academic and just like learning what it looks like to show up as the leader, but still as Tiana. Oh, yeah. I think she was a big part of me getting the courage just to keep trying it until I figure it out. And Mm -hmm. it's a daily growth thing. So I don't think any of us will ever, you know, fully embody our peak leadership. You know, we're human beings. So everything (laughs) is going to be daily growth. We're going to do really good one day and lead with courage and vulnerability. And then we're going to have a difficult conversation with somebody and we're going to kind of retreat back into our little, you know, wall until we realize like, Hey, I'm doing this thing and I need to step back out again and do this intentionally and do this with vulnerability, you know? So it's, it's going to be a process for all of us forever. But Brene is my girl uh, yeah. in my, in my brain. She's my best friend. She doesn't know. <laughs> <that. laughs> hey, one day she will put, write it down in your journal. That yeah, I, need, <laughs> I need to manifest that one. I've manifested Oprah, but Brene is definitely on the list. <laughs> oh, those are my top two. <laughs> that's amazing yeah and I'm the same way you know just going back to just figuring out who you are as a leader so figuring out who you are at your core and then what you want leadership to look like for you and then I think also you know just following the specific core principles so I had a podcast interview right before yours and I just asked about what leadership meant to this one on her name was Courtney. And I would just love to know if you find kind of the same common threads and where you need to absolutely have clarity in your vision and in what you want to create, because it goes back to what you said, you know, how can you lead others when you're unsure of what you're doing and where you're going? So she mentioned clarity. Um, she mentioned making confident decisions And she mentioned one more, let me see. Oh, having grace with yourself. So I I feel like you touched on that one too, when you talked about, you know, just being a human and just really knowing that you're going to ebb and flow through these energies. Oh, yeah. So again, like the having grace with yourself portion, obviously based on everything I said right before this, I'm definitely Mm -hmm. fully aligned with that one. Clarity is a big one for me too. And I could talk about it high level first, but then I I also have something kind of tactical to say about that. But high level, yeah, I totally agree with her. Like understanding It's kind of the idea, you should know your destination before you begin, within reason, obviously. Mm -hmm. But especially in a business setting or as an entrepreneur who is leading a business, and I mean, you are effectively a CEO at some point there, fully understanding like what your vision for the company is, where you want this to go, like what is your mission, what are your values? It doesn't have to be some formal corporate stuffy thing. And I know a a lot of times when I, I know a lot of times when I bring it up, I get the look because people are like, yeah, but I'm not like freaking Coca-Cola. So why do I need a vision statement? (laughs) And I understand that. I'm not saying it has to be like some formalized thing, but still as a leader, I mean, they do it for a reason and they have, they have it all very structured. I get it because it's corporate, but even if you're just journaling, it could be a quarterly practice to reevaluate. Do I still feel aligned with the direction that I want this thing to go in? As simple as that. We don't even have to use what is my vision statement for Q3. You don't know. You don't have to do that. But do, <laughs> yeah. do I feel good about the direction of my company? Do I feel like I'm actually heading in a direction or am I just moving and doing stuff mm. aimlessly? You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And as you're leading yourself, that's super important. But let me get tactical. 
Because as you're leading other people, it's tenfold. Mm, like yeah. leading other people, I call it like one of the most sacred roles any entrepreneur could ever have, because that means that you've you've built something up, you've taken it from the space of being the solopreneur, right, into actually being a business owner with a team, and that is a sacred role in the, in and of itself. Mm-hmm. But how it connects to clarity is like. Now that you have these people, not only that you are leading with influence, you are their boss. Like, and I, I separate those because when I'm, when I say boss, I'm talking about more of the management side of things. Okay. And the management side of things is important and people give it a bad rep. People are like, don't be a boss, be a leader. And I'm like, be both please, because (laughs) you can, you can have all the influence and we can like rally behind you. And we're like, yeah, we love what you're doing. But if we work with you and we don't know the direction of the business, if we don't know what the biggest goals are, if even down to the nitty gritty of like freaking SOPs, like how do we do Mm -hmm. post-production for this project that you want us to do? You know what I mean? Like providing clarity on that level is a very tactical thing to talk about, but it is a big part of leadership when you're talking about leading other people in a team. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree 100%. I'm right there with you, girl, from the episode before. <laughs> <laughs> I know you two are just so aligned. That's why I'm like, okay, this is a divine lesson or message for me to just really soak in your wisdom. So I want to talk about just the common mistakes that you see just from leadership in general. So this could be someone who is an employee or someone who's an entrepreneur. What are the things that usually cause a negative I don't I don't spirals kind of like dramatic for what I want to say but where do you see common mistakes that people are making where they can kind of get back into alignment and fix things I have a lot of thoughts okay okay (laughs) (laughs) so I want to start with the first one just because it kind of connects back to the the flip side of the coin with what I was just talking about Mm -hmm. and the differences between bosses and leaders oh yeah so again I am, you're, I'm not the leadership coach who's going to be like, bosses suck. There's a lot, you'd be surprised. There's a lot of blogs and everything out there, like trashing bosses. Oh my <laughs> I'm, gosh. Like, I'm like, poor bosses. But again, I just want to restate that when I talk about bosses, I'm talking about the management aspect of things. So mm-hmm. these are the, the traditional manager role right? That you see where they are responsible for, you know, assuring that tasks are completed, timelines are followed, deliverables are getting to clients. Like this is the accountability, the backbone behind making business work. So being a boss is so important, but the number one thing I see Uh, especially whether you work in corporate, whether you're an entrepreneur, like if you have a working relationship with anybody where you are held responsible for holding someone else responsible, I see that they are living in the stance of being a boss and they never dip one toe in being a leader. That's, Mm -hmm. That's my number one thing. Like, focusing so heavily on the tactical, the day-to-day management, it's so important. So I don't, I don't like to like blame here. Like it's critical work. And I don't want us to underestimate business does not get done without these people. Like this is important stuff. Right. (laughs) But the thing is, if they have that role, especially if it's like a traditional, like I am a manager or a district manager, whatever it is, a lot of times the focus is just a little too heavily on the day-to-day management boss aspect of things. And they don't really tap into the sacredness of what it means to be a leader. They don't really, they don't bother trying to create the rapport, the influence with their people because they've been given or they earned it. Let me not downplay them again. Mm -hmm. They, They have earned the designation, the title, and the responsibility of being a boss. But again, and I will always say this, as much as I love you bosses, I love you, but I will always say this, (laughs) just because you are somebody's boss does not mean you're their leader. Mm -hmm. You have to earn the leader. Like, 
I don't care if you're the regional manager of Coca-Cola. I live in Atlanta, so that's going to continue to be my example. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I don't, I don't care if you're the regional manager of Coca-Cola. You're their boss. But until you gain that respect, until you create the team culture, you gain their trust, like you're not really leading anybody. It's more of a yes, ma'am, no, ma'am situation. Rather than a yes, I, you know, I'm bought in to this vision. I'm bought into what we're doing as a team. And that's where in work, we don't really feel good when we're in teams and working relationships like that. Like we don't enjoy being yes, ma'am, no, man people. I mean, if we're Southern, we say that anyways, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so let's say someone is just heavily operating in boss mode, Mm -hmm. how do they really start to engage their team to create that culture so that they can also pull in that leadership element too? Like if you're, if you're in a work environment, how does that work? So to me, like the first step, it sounds like AA, right? The first step is recognizing that you have a problem. (laughs) (laughs) But also... Sorry, that was funny though. Uh, but once you like can recognize that and kind of own up to it, it does again, it doesn't mean you're like a bad person or anything, but you're just occupying that space a little too much. Mm-hmm. So once you recognize that that is a reality and a truth for you, it it can just start with being intentional about building in time, activities, interactions, deeper connection with your team that is not about that day to day. You see what I'm saying? Whether, and it could still be work related. I'm not saying we have to like go bowling. I don't, I I like work activities actually, but I'm not saying like force your people to go do random stuff with you (laughs) or something like that. But, you know, even just making sure that you are fostering connection with them. So if most of your conversations are, you know, garnered around tactical, like client X needs this, client Y needs that, you know, what's the ETA on this? Little things like being a human being, asking them how their kids are. Mm -hmm. (laughs) How was your weekend? Like, it sounds so silly sometimes when I say it, but you would be surprised the amount of people because, I mean, we don't got a lot of time, y'all. So we're stressed and I get it. But just making sure that we're being intentional about connecting with people on a level that's deeper than our to-do list. Mm -hmm. Like that's the very simply put first step is just trying to be intentional about that part. There's a lot of strategies and interventions. Like I do team retreats. There are like, you can do, we do a lot of business masterminds, but you can do that stuff with your team. Like there's a lot of stuff that people can do, but it all starts with being intentional about the little things. Yeah. And with our company, our project manager, she is actually really amazing at this. And little things that we do, sometimes we'll have meetings where we just start with a body check-in, like, how are you feeling today? What's active for you? Or we'll ask little questions like, what are you going to do today that makes your soul happy? And then Mm -hmm. it's really cool to just go around. um, We meet on Zoom. So just go around the little uh, virtual chat and just hear different people's explanations. You know, some people roller skate, um, some people live in Canada, so they go out and play in the snow. And it just, like you said, it brings that human element to the company. And then we get to learn things about each other that are more than like our business skills at work. Yeah. Sometimes we even pull, because we, (laughs) we're like very spiritual too. So sometimes Mm -hmm. we'll Cool. like oracle cards like well, what is what is something you're struggling with oh let me pull a card for you and see what the divine says so we operate a lot in that capacity but it's nice because it allows you like you said to get to know people on a different level and it just makes it fun like sometimes you just need to come to work and and have fun and I think creating an environment like that is what actually makes people even more productive because they're more yep. excited to come to work because they know that they're appreciated and they're not just a number. Oh, absolutely. More productive and actually more creative. 
Yes. And I think that's like a big one. Like I, I push that a lot, especially since now that I'm in the entrepreneur space, because so many of the businesses that I work with are creatively based, you know Mm -hmm. what I mean? Or, or they're teaching some skill or another, like marketing or something like that. But inevitably there's a very heavy creative component. And I'm always like, I understand like y'all have stuff to do. Y'all are busy. Y'all got all the things, but let me tell you, let me get y'all together in a, in a new environment, separate from what you normally do. And I work with a lot of virtual teams. So when they're virtual, I'm like, let me get y'all all in the same place. Mm-hmm. Let's get you somewhere new, somewhere none of you have ties. Give me three days. I will bet you money you're going to come up with your next million dollar business idea. Mm-hmm. Like it's inevitable when you can really get people one. Okay. Of course they have to have a decent working relationship for that to yeah. like be that magical. <laughs> but if you do, if you can get them out of the context or just out of the mindset of that work hustle, that's yeah, there's magic that can happen in that space. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I agree. It just, it comes from fun. Like I, creativity, mm-hmm comes from you just having fun and and taking a break, giving your brain a break and uh, creative projects, especially when you're tinkering with things or you're building things just for fun. I actually read a study on this and it just talks about how creativity gives our brains new ways of thinking about things, Um, Mm -hmm. like fun and playtime give our brains new ways of thinking about things. So it is important to just disconnect sometimes too. And um yeah, that's that's where I recharge. I took a couple of days off of work and I went up to uh, Mammoth and we went snowboarding and just having that time to kind of reset and just play around just for the sake of having fun. I came yeah. back to work and I was fired up. I was like, all right, y'all, let's do this. <laughs> you oh, know that I mean? is so cool. Yeah. <laughs> that is so, so cool. I've always wanted to go snowboarding. One day I will oh, just for yeah. fun. <laughs> Yeah, it's it, yeah, it's it, it's just a new skill set too that mm-hmm. you get to learn in and I'm always about brain development too. Right. Um, so and you sure. actually you just sparked something in me. So I do want to say like I know that the word and I love the word intentional. Like I know people have like a word of the year intentional is like the word of my life. It's just how my brain works. <laughs> yeah. And I truly am one of the most deliberate people. <laughs> with everything I do. But what you said sparked something in me because you were saying you do it just for fun. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I actually had to learn, to be honest. Like I can, I love the word intentional and I will always rock with it. So, you know, sorry, the word intentional, but learning how to do things just for fun was like actually a thing for me. Yeah. And I think like, especially if you are somebody like me, and, and you're leading people, it could be valuable to kind of check in with yourself and think, you know, how can I foster conversations or activities or circumstances or experiences just for fun for my people? Because I do know, like, I can be a little heavy because I'm so intentional. Mm-hmm. So even in the mornings, like, I try to, and I, I love to learn. So I'm always reading something or listening to a podcast or something like that. But I always try to not do something business related. Mm. Like I can be, I'm telling you, I could really be overly intentional with this. So I'll just have to like go on a walk or, you know, we'll randomly, my husband and I will randomly like rent these bikes that are now at a little dock station down by the river. And the other day I had like my dog pulling me on the bike and it was terrifying, but it was exhilarating. And I went home (laughs) and I was so excited. I like recorded a whole podcast episode for my, for my podcast type pod. Like it was great. You know what I mean? So (laughs) if you're like me and you can be overly deliberate because it is a thing, building in the just for fun is actually really, really great. So I love that you said that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I'm glad that you had that experience too. I can imagine what that's like. I've seen people who have allowed their dogs to pull them on skateboards and that Uh scares me just looking at them. Oh, I'll tell you, like I refused to go down the hill with her because I was like, (laughs) you are going 50 miles an hour. I swear to goodness. (laughs) Oh my goodness. But it, it just, it gives us it gives our brains just like those feel good hormones. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's why you were inspired to just come home and go at it. Cause 
yep. you got a break. And building in the fun for me, I love that term, building in the fun. I ha- It's a process for me still, um, but mm-hmm. it's something that I've been working toward for the last few years. And it's just so interesting how we it having fun and being creative, that's what we were designed to do. You know, as kids, that's the, that's what you yeah. naturally see kids doing. Like I love to watch kids play and just make up stuff and yeah. just be in the world. And that was very much me growing up. My cousins, you know, we had a, a backyard at my grandparents' house and you know, playing in mud, making mud pies, throwing mud at each other, just doing Mm -hmm. stuff to do it. I just really missed that so much. And I craved that because that taps into your freedom as well. So it's, it's a process y'all. Like when you really sit down and just think about your, your day to day, you know, how often are you lending time for fun or is it just toward like, I need to build this and I need to build that. And then also, how can you make small shifts in your day to just bake in time just for you? So yeah. like Tiana says, sometimes that's just taking a walk just to be. And I love doing that as well. Right before our podcast, I was just outside in the sun, just hanging out in the breeze just because. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then I felt good and I, I got, I was really excited for our conversation today. So yeah, I'll tell you. Know. With dinner, because we're in different time zones, y'all. But with dinner, (laughs) right a little bit before we got on with dinner, I just like randomly got this urge. And I was like, I want to eat dinner outside. Mm -hmm. And my husband was like, the outdoor patio table is like really dirty. And I was like, well, let's go sit on the porch then. Like something in me. So, you know, sometimes we just feel it. And I can be the person that fights that feeling. Mm -hmm. But today I just chose to go with it and it felt so good. So if you feel it, if you feel like you need a break, if you feel like you need to just turn up the music, I do this too. It's, I I wasn't going to tell you this, but (laughs) if if you need to turn up the music and have a dance party, like an idiot by yourself and you like, do it. It's life doesn't have to be that serious all the time. And this is coming from somebody who takes just about everything very seriously. So we got to let that go a little bit. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And your, your body will tell you when it's time, you know, Mm -hmm. it's never a question of, should I, like you will inherently feel it. Even if you feel like you're the person who is the most disconnected from your body, you'll, when you start to, especially when you start to get tired or fatigued, or you're starting to experience some burnout, those are signs where it's like, you need to kind of step away for a minute. And yes, the project is going to be fine. Yes. Everything's going to be okay. If you just even take five minutes to go stand out Mm -hmm. in the sun and just stand there with your eyes closed and just appreciate. So absolutely. Yes. So let's talk about, I want to talk about creating a healthy work environment. Um, Mm -hmm. I feel like we've been touching on little things as far as connecting with teams. And like, we just talked about play, how can someone set up their, their work environment just to make sure that they're incorporating all this stuff, just to, just to tie it all in. So I think I'm going to say what not to do first. (laughs) Okay. I love that. (laughs) Okay. So what not to do is like one of the big things that I see a lot is assuming that people understand you which sounds really weird. And assuming like people are not mind readers. And this is a big thing. And I I wanted to start with this one because I think that it applies very directly to leaders, but it also applies to employees, you know, people who aren't actively leading teams and whatnot. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest things, it actually, matter of fact, it applies to every facet of your life, to be honest. Like, Thinking that people can read our minds gets us into a lot of trouble a lot of times. It really does, especially at work. Because, and it's interesting because it's like, because these are work relationships, unless you have a phenomenal boss and a phenomenal team and phenomenal leadership, which one day that will be the case for like the majority of people and my heart will be so happy. But the reality is a lot of people are not living in that dream state right now. Mm -hmm. And just like walking in the space of just thinking that people should know why you did something you did, or even more tactically, they should know what you expect out of them. 
Mm-hmm. And I'm talking to my leaders very specifically right now, as a matter of fact. Nobody knows what you expect until you tell them. Right. And that's to my leaders, but that's to everybody who's ever listening to this episode. Nobody knows your expectations until you tell them your expectations. So a big part of working with other people is just being really clear about stuff like that. And it doesn't have to be pushy. It doesn't have to be bossy, but simple things like when a project begins or in you're having like the initial project meeting, here's what I would really love to get out of this. And here are the roles that I think we could all play into making this happen. Mm -hmm. Just facilitating conversations like that is way better than being like, this is the project. Here are the steps. We're going to do it. This is the timeline. Go. And then getting mad (laughs) when people aren't executing in the way that you would execute. You see what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, I've, yeah. <laughs> we all we have all experienced some version of that in the whole time. Like when it happens to me, I'm just like, this is crazy. Y'all, <laughs> y'all are not communicating your expectations. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> what not what not to do to foster a good work environment is think that people can read your mind. Okay. We are not mind readers, y'all. Okay. What I think that people can really do to help facilitate a truly healthy work environment, we did touch on it earlier. And I think a really big part of that that's missing is vulnerability. And I think that that is going to be a continued evolution and a continued practice for a long time because the truth of the matter is like we struggle with that personally. And it's only just now in the last few years becoming a topic that gets regularly brought up at work. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like it was, no, don't bring your feelings to work. Uh, No. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Don't bring none of that. You are here to do a task and then leave. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And so with the shift, I think that it's really important. We talked about it a ton, so I'm not going to beat it into the ground, but I do think it's really important that people start to kind of tune into that and just start trying to incorporate it in little ways. You know what I mean? Yeah. I also think transparency and honesty is like really, really, really valuable when it comes to creating more of a healthy space. And transparency doesn't mean that like everybody needs to know all about everything you do in your whole life. They need to know your political beliefs, your religious beliefs. <laughs> yeah. Like, no, no, no. They're, uh, listen to Brene. Okay, y'all, there are still boundaries. <laughs> <laughs> and being transparent, you can still set boundaries and share with what is comfortable with you. But especially if you are in a leadership position or you have informal influence or whatever the matter is, like having as much transparency as possible, that serves a purpose. So, you know, I work, in, I work in corporate a lot, right? And one of the big things that happens in corporate is like mergers and acquisitions, like big changes. This company bought this company. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times like stuff is kept very tightly under wraps in those situations because there's all sorts of money involved, all this stuff that I won't get into. But in those scenarios, like one of the things the company teaches its leaders a lot is like, how can you be as transparent as possible when you even legally cannot actually t- say everything? Mm-hmm. And that's a thing. So it's just tapping into what can I say? And what is the purpose of what I'm saying? Like, it's not transparency for the sake of transparency, but as human beings, like we like to know what's going on. So if there are changes in your company, or if you're an entrepreneur and you're not feeling the direction of your business, but you haven't briefed your team on, you know, like where your heart and your head is at and what you think needs to happen. A lot of times we can sense those things. Like we can feel that there is some sort of unrest and we can feel that it doesn't feel good. And we're like, what the heck is going on? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so at a certain point, no matter what scenario you're in, especially if it's something kind of tumultuous, you know what I mean? Kind of upsetting, figuring out how transparent you can be with the people that you're coming into contact with at work, 
I think goes a long way. And it inevitably, like it helps people respect you Mm -hmm. and it helps people value you because we're not transparent with other human beings that often, y'all. So when you do this, people Mm -hmm. notice and we feel it and we're like, oh, wow, like she owned that. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. And then you're like, oh my goodness, they're they're human too. They're going through stuff too. And I think it just goes back to mentioning this earlier. It builds that trust and that connection so that you know that you are important to this company and that you matter because they're choosing to bring you into these conversations. So it's not just about the company, but it is about, you know, caring about the livelihood about the people for the people who are working with you and alongside you. So. Absolutely. And I would, I would, the last thing that I would add for a healthy work environment, like above all, I would probably want to emphasize like the importance of communication and connection. Mm -hmm. And I think you gave a really beautiful example about what your company does at the beginning of meetings, right? How you guys check in with each other about things that are not work related and little things like that obviously go a very, very, very long way. And then I mentioned this earlier, but like with the virtual teams that I work with, a lot of them have never met in person. (laughs) And I've been on teams that way. Like I've, I have been on a virtual team. I want to say the first six months I was with them and we weren't far. We were like a couple of States away y'all, but the first six months I didn't meet a single soul which is okay. okay. And they, they eventually built it into where within that first year I did get to connect with people in real life, which was nice. I was like, Oh, you're a human being, not just a voice. This is right. (laughs) (laughs) But also like, especially with these virtual businesses, or even if you're partially virtual, uh, what you mentioned earlier, the zoom call, not even the content of what you guys were talking about, but the fact that you're on video chat goes a long way. Mm -hmm. Like, I studied what it means to be a virtual leader. That was actually my thesis back in graduate school. Mm -hmm. Uh, But in virtual leadership, one of the biggest parts about it is using those, we call it media rich, but it's basically video chats. Using video chats over phone calls whenever possible. Connecting in real life over video chats whenever possible. You see what I mean? And we can take it for granted, I feel, especially in 2020, like my job is 90% virtual. So I get it. Like we can do our jobs with our computers most of the time. A lot of times we truly don't need to be in person, but I always tell my leaders, if your team is a hundred percent virtual, please prioritize connecting with them in real life, at least just once a year. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that that's like my minimum. That's my thing for a healthy work environment because we can connect so deeply over video chat on social media, like all the things. And we're good at it. Like we've had some years to get used to this stuff. So we've been trained. Right. But no matter what the shifts and the transformations that I see with teams who get together in real life, even if they facilitated really beautiful bonds virtually for a long time. It's, it's bar none, like it's next level and it's just got to happen. So what did I recap? Let me recap video over phone whenever possible. I know sometimes we got to like do work in our PJs with a face mask on. I do it too, but video, (laughs) video over phone whenever possible in real life over video, whenever possible, at least once a year, please. I am begging you. (laughs) I agree with that. It it just changes the dynamic. We've we've met, we've all met in person a couple of times. I don't think there's there's two people I don't know, but that's because they're in um countries that are further away. So mm-hmm. but the ones in the states, those are the ones that I have met um because those are the ones who come in the most for our events. And right. It is yeah, I can't explain it. It's just it's just so different. Um, Yeah. And it's, it's nice to see that other side too. So. Yeah. I don't have any technical, I know I'm a nerd. I don't got no technical terms for it, but at the end of the day, we're human beings. So like as good as we are with this technology, (laughs) you can't match in person. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Like there's, there is no remedy. There is no (laughs) activity I can give you that is going to outperform in-person interaction. (laughs) (laughs) 
Yes. Oh, this conversation was so incredible. Thank you so, so much, Tiana. I feel like um, we're just walking away with so much information, especially, I mean, at the start of the call, you you just came with it the whole entire call, but even just talking about, you know, leadership is having influence and and what that means and breaking that down and talking about the difference between you know, being a boss and being a leader and how to integrate the two and just different leadership styles. I mean, like I can go on and on, but this was such a beautiful conversation. So thank you so, so much. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I loved every minute of it. (laughs) Yay. So I would love for you to just share where people can find you, Mm -hmm. And then I'll also follow up and put the links in the show notes. But yeah, let's let people know where you hang out, where they can follow up with you. Yeah. So pretty much if you know my name, you can find me. So (laughs) my website is tianatai.com. My Instagram is at tianatai. My podcast is called Thai Pod. So you can find me all those places. I'm also on Facebook, but you should really catch me on Instagram. Like that's, that's where I'm at pretty much. I am not on TikTok, although people are trying to convince me (laughs) We'll see one day. Y'all let me know. Like, come to my Instagram and tell me if I need to get a TikTok. I don't know. I'm not convinced. (laughs) I mean, (laughs) you did mention dance parties. So. Oh, that would be something. (laughs) (laughs) Your daily dance party. Find Tiana on TikTok. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Okay. This was so good. So rich. And thank you to all of you who have listened and tuned in to today's podcast. And we will catch you next time for another episode. Take care.